This is a question and answer session. Any questions? Anybody has any question? This is a good time to ask. Yes. What's a good question to ask? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's stumped me. <laughs> Great Master said that we only ask questions to which we already have the answers. That the answer lies inside our head. That if we did not have the answer, we would not be able to formulate a question. The words of the question are formed based on the answer already sitting inside. That is why when anybody answers your question to your satisfaction, you say, that's right. <laughs> Otherwise you would say, I don't understand what you are saying. But I will tell you, love is the answer, no matter what the question. I, I, I borrowed this from Mary Hoyt. Yes. Uh, I've got a question. Yes. Uh, you know, I have this experience with ghosts, right? And my question is, when you when you experience them, and they're they're in the astral world, they have the ability to pass through our physical bodies, right? Yes. Okay. In space and time. Is, is it possible for, obviously it's possible for them to occupy the same space at the same time based on the space-time continuum? First of all, they do not live in the astral world for us to experience them. They have to be in the physical astral overlap, okay. which means they are half in the physical world and half in the astral. As you know, the astral world separately is quite, quite independent of the physical world. But there's an overlap between the physical and the astral, and that's where these disembodied spirits reside. And where is the energy, what, what effect does the energy have so the physical and the astral meet? They, they can occupy the same place that you are occupying, in which case you will speak a different language, and we will call you possessed. <laughs> You've seen that. There was a friend of mine in, uh, in, in India. Every Thursday, he got possessed by a different spirit. And he spoke in a female voice. The man spoke for that day in a female voice. And somebody came and repeated the five words. And that female voice said, I can't stay here anymore. I'm running. So the power of the five words of Simran is so strong, no possession can exist there. When I came to this country in 1962, in 63, there were people who were haunted by these ghosts. One of the families living in Detroit was haunted by a master's ghost. They said the master, we had a master, a spiritual master, and he has died and his ghost is haunting us. I said, you should be happy, lucky, that the master is around you even after he's dead physically. They said, no, he's messing our life. He's like a peeping Tom when we have a bath, he comes and peeps. <laughs> Please, can't you do something? Let the master be around when we are sitting in a living room. What business has he to come into the bathroom? I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But uh, I, I can come and visit and check the energy of the master. So I visited their home, and the master ran like nobody's business, and never came again. So it's very simple. There are so many disembodied spirits, and you can't even know which one they are. The disembodied spirits can pretend to be somebody else. Right. So here's the other question. So the, the, the other side of it is true as well, that when the two energies meet, the physical and the astral, the astral being can also take on uh, the energies of the, of the physical being, right? Oh, yes. Okay. That's true. That's so true. A, it works both ways. Both ways. It works both ways. The whole secret is in your awareness of what's going on. If you have awareness of the astral plane, you can have the awareness right here. That's what meditation is all about. To have awareness of all levels, possible levels of consciousness while you are here. So if you have that awareness, you deal with all these things effectively. 
So that's what uh, good about meditation. <coughs> In meditation, you can increase the power to handle all these situations about ghosts and disembodied spirits. I I have had a problem because the ghosts are afraid of me, and I keep on telling them. You know, in India, I'm talking of. I haven't. I've met a few ghosts here. You know that. But in India, when I was young, the ghosts used to come and run. I said, "Why are you running? We are not scaring you." But they got scared for nothing. And unfortunately, there is no Casper in India. <laughs> Casper, the friendly ghost. <clears throat> I never saw one day. Anyway, the ghost stories. They're nice ghost stories. Uh, I had a, I had a girl studying with me in school, and she was uh, must have been ten or eleven years old. We were going to the same class in in school, in school, and one day she got high fever, and she lay in bed with that fever, and she belonged to a Muslim family, believed in Allah and the Quran and so on. So she, uh, her parents were very disturbed because she was getting weaker and weaker with that fever, special kind of fever she had. Nobody could diagnose, and ultimately, she, they feared that she'll die. Doctors said there's no way to save her, so she died. And when they, di- when she died, they took her, made a nice coffin for her, and took her. I was very sad to hear she was a good friend of mine. We used to walk to the school together. So when she died, and they were about to bury, and they had dug the grave, they went to bury the coffin. The coffin moved, and they opened the coffin. The girl walked out with no fever, no illness, like she was normal. And they said we were just going to bury a live child, but the doctors had certified she was dead. Anyway, everybody was happy that we saved the life of the girl in time. Next day, she went to school with me. So she talked to me, and she told me her strange experience. She said, "When I was lying with fever, I was so sick I couldn't move my hands, I couldn't make shake my head, and I was lying on the bed, and I saw two short-statured men come into the room, and you know we have doors there uh, that open out inside the house, and the doors were open." And one of those short men, he jumped up and sat on the top of the door with his legs hanging. <coughs> the short guy. The second guy stepped on the other side of the door, and they're both sitting. And I'm looking at them, and I'm trying to tell my parents, "Can't you see the intruders have come in? And can't they see?" But I couldn't speak. I had no voice. And those two were just laughing and saying something to each other, and I lay helpless. And my dad sitting on one side put his head down with sadness. My mother was sitting on the other side of the bed, and nobody could notice. She says I was surprised. So this girl telling me the story while going to school, and then suddenly those two <laughs> guys jumped down from there, and one came to her feet, and one came to her head, and one picked up her feet from one side as if she, they were to pull pull her, and the other one put his hands under her head. And she couldn't imagine that the dad and mom sitting there, are sitting sad. They can't see that two people are coming like this in the house. And then they both picked her up, and picked her up into the toward the ceiling, and went right through the ceiling along with her. They went right through the ceiling, and up in the sky. And they were flying for a while, and then they were talking to each other in chaste Urdu. That was their home language. They were talking to each other in chaste Urdu. And they were talking of many appointments they had, so many appointments they had, something she heard, but she couldn't believe how how could she be flying like that? And who were these people who could make her fly up like that in the in the air? So they flew for quite a while, very high. It looked like she was being lifted higher and higher. Then suddenly one of the guys tell the other, "Oh, we made a mistake." This was a mistake, and something about a mistake, and they began to descend very quickly. When she descended, she doesn't know how long it was when she was flying. When she descended, she felt somebody had put a plank of wood on her face, so she tried to move it. And that was the coffin from which she walked out. I heard this story. I was so surprised. 
I said, those must be the angels of death. We heard stories about them, but I never heard a person describe a personal experience. We have heard about near-death experiences in the United States are always seeing white light and all that stuff. She didn't see any white light. She just picked up by two dwarfy angels, <laughs> un unseen by the parents, and then they make mistakes. I never knew angels make mistakes. <laughs> they made a mistake. I must tell you, one week later she died, and she never recovered. They waited for a long time that this may be something. They had to marry her in the same place. I attended her funeral and I her. My brother was in the Navy, in the British Navy, and he had seen action in the Gulf War or somewhere, and he had seen people die on the boat, and he was never frightened of anybody. He came home on, on leave. And on leave at night, I told this story about what happened to the girl. In the middle of the night, he wakes up and says to our mother, Mom, I want to come and sleep with you. I can't sleep. I'm seeing two dwarfs with their heads like me. <laughs> so a guy like him in the Navy got frightened of the story. <laughs> so their ghost stories can really be uh, affecting people. But this, uh, I came to this country and I was told, that is in the 60s, 62, 63, when I first came, that there are witches here. And, and that witches are not all bad witches and they don't travel on the ram. What are they? Roads. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They don't carry those things and fly on those. Witches are like human beings. And they're good witches. And they're bad witches and they're good witches. So I said, I'd like to meet a few good witches. Maybe some good looking witches. <laughs> I, was, I was, I didn't realize that the witches could be men. There was a society of good witches here, I forget the name of the society, and the president of the society lived in Minnesota and on a hill, on a, uh, on a hill, I forget the name of the place, but the president was a very heavy fat man. So they said, you can meet the president of the witches. I said, sure, I'd like to meet them. So there were some satsangi friends of that time, the 60s I met, they took me to meet the president of the witches society. So. He was very, you know, sitting in a big chair. The build was so big, he needed a big chair. And I was a small fry compared to him. So I said, I'm very pleased to meet you, President of the Witches. And uh, he said, oh yeah, don't think all witches are negative. We have positive witches. He gave me a little small description of the witchcraft and what kind of witchcraft they practice. And I said, you know, I have been seeing ghosts and witches all my life. You know, they're scared of me. When I said that, he began to shake. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Such a big man is shaking like this, like a jelly. <laughs> Why are you frightened? No, 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 don't tell me anymore. I had that actual experience here in this country. The president of the witches society. So I don't know whether those witches are real or not. They claim that some of these witches and some of these disembodied spirits can enter into live bodies and take over and then they, that's called walk-ins and they walk into another body then they start functioning in the body i do know that the ghosts are missing their bodies that i know those who are in this the disembodied spirits which are trapped here now there are two ways of getting trapped if you die in an accident and your notional life there's a thing called notional life in the law of karma that you have a notion in life that you should live 60 years or 65 years, you've been in an accident at 35 years, so 30 more years of notional life. And that notional life is still spent here with karma, right here, though you do have no physical body. So the disembodied body stays here. If you commit suicide, you are trapped right at the place of suicide. And if it's a murder or violence, you are trapped right there. But if you die of other causes earlier, for some reason, and the notional life is still there, then you wander around. So there are two types of ghosts. Those who are stuck at one place, which haunt the place, and those who wander around, who are called, we call them Bhut and Pre in India. The two types. Bhut, B-H-O-O-T, Bhut means a wandering 
disembodied ghost. And Pret means one who stuck at one place. So these people are missing their bodies and they try to find some way to communicate with us. They try some way to haunt us. Not necessarily to frighten us. We get frightened because we're natural. We studied law and we studied the laws of nature and we studied biology and we studied physics and chemistry and we say, oh, there's no such thing as a ghost. And then something strange is happening. And then we can't believe it's happening. And then we get frightened because we didn't, don't expect it. But if you know that they exist and you're dealing with them on a daily basis, which a lot of people do, I know some of my meetings are attended by ghosts. Do you know, how many of you were here at the last Bandara? Do you know, when I was sitting and talking here, there were three other people here? Some of you knew. One was a lady who died one day earlier, the first April. And she was in telephone, physical telephone communication with me for several weeks. She wanted to die. She said, when will I get rid of this body? And come, but I want to come to Bandara. I said, you will come to Bandara. Don't worry. And she said, how will I come? I'm so sick. She was in the hospital all that while. But she died just one day before, so she could come to the Bandara. <laughs> and she sat right next to me in an imaginary chair, a disembodied spirit. And I could see, and she was happy. But she wanted to sit on the right side, another ghost took over the right side. Another lady who died on the east coast. Do you remember? <coughs> Verna, Verna Park. When I went to east coast, people are here from east coast. And you remember we had a program there and one lady said, I want to sit next to you. Her name was Verna, Verna Power. You remember? And I said, yes, sit next to me. So we, we took a chair. You arranged it. She sat next to me in those programs in the East Coast. And then she was always talking of other planets and so on and that uh, the people come from other planets. She introduced me to some people from other planets. I found they were earthly people, but they were not from planets. But they pretended to be from other planets. They, didn't, they were not really from other planets. So we had some good conversation. Then she asked me, because she had asked me many times when her end will come. So she asked me if this is it. This is the end. This is the last time I'm going to sit there. And Joyce, Joyce is here, I think. Joyce was coming to me to ask a question. And I said, yes, this is it. Joyce only heard these words, this is it. She said, are you telling her she's going to die? I said, everybody has to die. Why are we, we, nobody should be afraid of dying. We don't really die, we just change bodies. We change our forms. Nobody ever dies. No human being can die. No spirit can ever die. No spiritual being can ever die. We are all in <laughs> different forms. So I said, yes. And she died with the intention of coming to Bandara. And she did come. She was sitting right here. She took the place which Dorothy could not take. Was on the other side. She wanted to be on the right side, she's there. So, sometimes you may, while you're sitting in a meeting with me, and you find an empty chair next to you, don't think it's always empty. <laughs> one of my cousins, one of my cousins died in India. Usha. You remember? His cousin died last year. And I went there. She was still alive. But she was uh, bedridden. She was in very bad state and we knew she would pass away any time. But she had an old relationship with a guy who had moved to this country and died here. So when she died, she didn't know where to go. So I visited her for her last rites or funeral and things like that. And then I told my sisters that cousin of mine is going to go with me. She wants to go to America because she found out that the guy she wants to be with is in America. So I bought a ticket on Northwest Airlines and all the seats were taken except the one next to me. <laughs> 
and a man comes and says while walking, can I take this seat? I said, don't you see it's occupied? <laughs> that one seat remained empty. <laughs> there were two segments of the plane, one from Delhi to Amsterdam and Amsterdam to Chicago. In both planes, one seat was empty next to me. So we have had some strange experiences like that. And then when she was here, she of course fled away to that place. So there are so many experiences of this kind that you will have, but there's nothing to be afraid of. It's just another way of life. They are caught by their karma. We are caught by karma in our bodies. They are caught by their karma in their astral bodies in the astrophysical overlap. It's very normal. It's a normal thing that is happening. It's a part of the natural creation here. It's not something extraordinary. Ishwar, you mentioned uh, a while back a story about a girl that grew up, you grew up with in your town, and she passed away, and it was about, there was a well involved. Oh, that's my sister. <laughs> you want to tell, could you share that? With my sister, sister Rama, that's my sister. She's still there. When one of my young sisters was born, uh, she had a problem, she could not eat, she could not laugh, she could not cry. And she, uh, her hands was shaking like this. She grew up getting weaker and weaker, force feeding her. So there was no way, doctor said this is a disease called St. Vitus dance, it was called St. Vitus dance some kind of a shaking head and not being able to digest anything. And unlike most infants, she wouldn't cry. So that unless she cries, she can never be healthy. So my dad said, Ishwar, this girl is going to die. Let's take her to Great Master. Great Master was alive at that time. At least she can have darshan <coughs> of Great Master. She can look at the Great Master and save her in the next life. So next life she'll become a disciple. So we uh, took her to Great Master and he was coming down from the stairs and we were waiting and uh, my dad was holding that little baby and he said, you know, this girl has got this disease and she can't survive. All doctors have given up hope. So we said, let her have a darshan. And Great Master laughed. He said, daughters don't go away like that without taking their share of what they, you owe them. That's all he said. We took it as a joke almost. But as soon as we came back to the house we have in the Dera, she began to giggle, she began to have a hiccup, and she began to cry. And after that she began to eat and grow up like a normal child. Except for one difference, that all the time she talked of my house, I will go to my house when she started talking. Also, like children say, Baba, Mama, you know, when they're growing up and they don't speak any words, the very first words she would speak were Kanta, Shanta, nobody in our house has those names at all. She was taking names which don't exist. And we were all wondering, where does she learn these from? They said, oh, there's a maid servant, she teaches this. The maid servant was Muslim. She didn't know Hindu names. These were Hindu names she was taking. And then as she grew up in a few years, Two, three years old, she began to talk more and more of her sister named Kanta, her sister named, her brother named Om, Om Prakash. None of these names exist anywhere in our family, not even distant family. So we wondered where these names come from. We couldn't solve that problem. Then my mother's sister, she came to stay with us for a few days. And she fell sick in the house. And we called a doctor to see her at the house. Doctor came and we never talked to him, but this sister of my mother, my aunt, she said to the doctor, Doctor, there's a strange thing going on in this house. There's a little girl here and she speaks strange names. She says, Kanta, Shanta, Om Prakash. There's nobody of that name here. He said, What does she say? Doctor said. She says, Kanta, Shanta, and Om Prakash. She says, They are my neighbor's children. He's a bookseller. He has a bookstore and his children's names are exactly these. They are my patients. How is it possible? We were also shocked to hear this doctor saying, he said, I can take you. This must be a case of reincarnation. Looks like she was in that family 
and has been reborn in your house and she still remembers the names of the past life. Let's verify it. So we took a car with the doctor next day and we used to tease her. Her name is Rama. We used to tease her, Rama, there's your house. And she would say, no, that's not my house. My house has three sides. We could never understand that phrase. We would say, that looks like your house. No, my house has three sides. We couldn't imagine what three-sided house can mean. So he took us to the store. The bookseller's name was Tulsi Das. So Tulsi Das ran the bookstore. And we went and we saw the bookstore. Tulsi Das bookstore. And she said, that's my house. We still thought she was making a mistake. That's a store. That's not a house. As soon as we stopped the car, she ran in. And we found the house was behind the store and was at three sides. Three sides were eventually in the front of the store. And so she recognized it immediately. So we followed her into the store. We met this man. We said, we have a strange case of this little child taking these names. And this doctor has come and told us, where are your children's names? And he said, yes, I have, I have this girl, but one of them died. When did she die? She died in August. August 2nd of May, she died in August. This girl was born the same year, on 30th of December. She died in August. This one is born in December, end of December. Baby, we, do, we didn't fit in. That means when my mother was pregnant with this girl, the other girl was alive. That means it's wrong to assume that the life transfers from one person to another at, at, at conception because he was still alive in another body. In August, she died and then this one is born. It fitted in more with what Great Master has been explaining to us that the destiny of a person is made much before the body is made. Therefore, the destiny is made even before conception and the body is built according to that destiny. But the actual transfer of the soul the living being, the consciousness, takes place in the fifth month of pregnancy. When the quickening takes place in the mother's womb, that's when the actual soul it becomes a separate body. Before that, it's an embryo. It's part of the mother. After that, it becomes a fetus and is a separate being and a separate body there. So, it fitted in with the dates that they were telling us. But then, we went in and we were, she recognized her dad. And they, we went in and we saw there was a courtyard and the three rooms, living rooms there on the three sides and there was a well in the center of that courtyard. So we spent some time there and the dad, old dad of past life, took out some money from his pocket. He said, I owe you something. He gave to my sister and Rama accepted it. And then we left saying this was a very strange case and he said, I recognize. I can ask her one more question to be sure she is my old daughter. So he took her aside and asked a question. And he came with tears in his eyes. He says, she is my old daughter. Come back again, reincarnated. And we said, okay, we left in the car. On the way out of curiosity, somebody in the car asked, Rama, what did he ask you? That you could be certain that he was the old daughter. He said, he asked me, if you remember the well, that's what you did. You remember the well? She said, of course I remember. You pushed me into it. That's how I died. And then, she says, then he cried. So, he said, this is strange. We went back to the store to check with him. He said, you know, this girl is saying that you asked her about a well. And she says that this, you threw her into the well and that's how she died in the past life. He said, no, 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 I never asked that question. So what did you ask her? Which convinced you that she is your old daughter. What I asked her was, where did we keep your clothes? And she pointed out to the correct dresser. And she said, don't tell lies. You asked me about the well. She was still standing there. And he said, no, no, I can, I can never do that. I said, Mr. Tulsi Das. This is not going to be held as legal evidence against you for murder. But it proves that when you think you killed somebody, the person can still come back and haunt you and tell you that you are the murderer. 
and it happens. This is a, a case. So then this, this case became popular. People said, here is a woman remembering past life. They began to worship as a goddess. He said, we better move from here, from the town. And she, now she used to tell us stories of her past life till that day when we went to the store. After that, she never added any more to the story. Anybody would ask her past life, she would only repeat the old stories. Nothing new after that date. So this was a very classic case. There is a book by one of the, uh, one of the British uh, authors who lived in India, got initiated by great master, then moved on to South Africa. In that book, he has mentioned this whole story that I told you about reincarnation, that that's what convinced him about reincarnation. Truthfully, even I was fully convinced only after this incident. Because people questioned. There's no real proof of reincarnation. Though one professor, Banerjee, in Jaipur, in India, has made a case study around the world of, of people remembering past life. And he's compiled a list of 1,000 cases, including cases in Russia, where they not only, not only at that time in the communist Russia, they not only did not believe in reincarnation, they didn't believe in God, they didn't believe in religion, they believed in nothing. And he picked up cases from there. A Russian girl remembering something in Japan and giving exact details. And they and he went all around checking out those details and publishing a book. But I said, people don't believe. When this case was presented to the Russian Academy of Scientists, the Academy of Scientists in Russia examined the case and he said, we have evidence of reincarnation. They examined all the evidence and they said, this is not reincarnation. This is a simple case of some of the molecules of the old body who died in Japan being swirled around by the westerly winds around and becoming part of the body and then settling in the brain of the newborn. And therefore the memory in those cells that have flown around the world has come into the new body. And therefore the memory thinks that she was the same person. This is the explanation the academy gave. Then somebody said, but that would be extremely rare for a molecule like that to travel around and settle in somebody's head like that. They said that's why such cases are so rare. <laughs> Otherwise everybody would remember their past lives. The fact that so few remember their past lives proves our point. So the communist uh, scientists in Russia didn't accept the incarnation. And I used to think like them, that too. Maybe there is some, maybe we are making up too many stories. How do we know about reincarnation? How do we know we have past lives? And I, I asked this great master. I said, Master, should we believe on blind faith? You said, don't believe anything on blind faith at all. And how do we believe this old karma and all that stuff going on and that's why we are paying our old for karma and getting rewarded for good karma we did? Where is the proof of that? There could be the whole world, the bulk of the Christian community in this world. 30% of the world are Christians today. And they don't believe in reincarnation. The ones who believe in it, believe secretly. They come and tell me secretly, we do believe it. But in the church, we don't believe it. So, such a bulk of religious people are not believing in reincarnation. Where is the proof that there is reincarnation? Great Master Raft, he said, you know, it's no use trying to find intellectual proof. You want to find proof, go and see your own past lives. Why do you want to study other people's past lives? You can see your own past lives one after the other. And you want to know who did it? Ask Julian Johnson. American. Missionary. Christian. He said, ask that Christian missionary. Came and became my disciple. Christian missionary saw all his past lives, recorded them. And he said, he remembered up to the time when he was a caveman. And how one of the actions was almost destroying his child by throwing him into a well. In Dr. Julia Johnson's own past lives. And he knew exactly how the events have taken place in this present life because of past lives. My wife's uncle was a photographer in Kashmir. <coughs> And Julian Johnson accompanied Great Master for a vacation to the hill station in Kashmir in India. 
and there he wanted to get a nice picture, a studio picture taken of great master. He said, Master, we don't have any real good photograph of yours. And I want to take pictures and send them to America also to my friends to, to tell them who the master is. They have no idea. I keep writing letters to them. And these pictures they take with little Kodak. Cameras are no good. I want to get a studio picture taken. So he found out that the best studio in the city is run by a man, Mr. Mehta, who happened to be Toshi's uncle, my wife's uncle. So he went to that studio to get Great Master's picture taken. And he had a studio in, in the basement of the building and a store selling cameras and so on on the upper floor. So the uncles, that man Mr. Betta would stay on the top and his assistant Mr. Bawa took pictures in the basement. So when this man went and met the Mr. Betta and said, I want to get somebody's picture taken, I've got somebody in the car. My uncle, my, that Mr. Mehta thought, he must have picked up some pretty girl, he's an American tourist. He's picked up some pretty girl dressed up in a Kashmiri outfit and he wants to take her picture, maybe his picture with her, something like that. He said, Mr. Baba, take some good pictures. So, Mr. Baba went and Judy and Johnson went and brought great master from the, from the car and got his beautiful pictures taken. A couple of pictures which had many of the books you can see, those pictures that were then taken first time in the studio. After three days, he said, pick up the pictures. So Julian also went up and out of curiosity, Mr. Mehta said, let me see what pictures this guy, American guy has brought. So he saw old bearded white man, white bearded man. He says, what happened to you? I thought you picked up some good, pretty good looking girl to take pictures with her. You found an old man with a white beard to take his pictures. He says, no, 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 he's not a... Old man, he's the master. He's my master. He said, Do you know how many gurus there are in this country who make a fool of you guys who come here? They pretend to be masters. There is no real master. They all pretend to be masters. And you have been fooled by, by this man. He told Julian Johnson. Julian Johnson said, No, I have a lot of evidence in my own personal life and the change it has made in me to know he's a master. He says, no, you are being mistaken. You are being brainwashed by this man. Anyway, take the pictures, they are yours. But by the way, what do you do in America? He said, I am a doctor, I am a surgeon and a physician. And I was a missionary here. He said, you are a real doctor? MD? Said, yes, I am an MD. You know, Mr. Mehta said, I have had a backache for a long time. Can you recommend something for it? So you come from an American uh, medical knowledge, you must have more knowledge than our doctors. He said, yes, I can take care of your backache, but you have to come to the Dera. You come there and uh, uh, I'll take care of you. He said, sure, I'll come there. He got the address of the Dera and he went and stayed with Dr. Julian Johnson. And Julian Johnson gave him some rub, rub and elements and something to relieve his pain of the back. But every day, Julian Johnson would run, have to go see the master. I'm going to his darshan. I'm going to have a look at the master's face. In the evening, I'm going for a discourse. And Mr. Mehta says, I can't believe such a highly educated man like you, a good doctor, can be following the superstitious things that you are doing. What is the darshan stuff when you talk all about it? He says, no, 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 he's a perfect master. He knows everything. And he gives answers to all my questions. He says, he's sure making a fool of you. For seven days, he kept on arguing with him, staying in his house and seeing Dr. Julian Johnson walk up and down in the morning for Darshan and the evening for his course. At last, he says on the seventh day, look, does he give you any real knowledge? Can he tell you why we are here? Can he tell you how we became human beings? Can you tell him reincarnation is real? Can he tell you all this stuff? Oh, yes, he can give all the answers. You write down your questions. And I'll ask him the answers. So, Mr. Mehta began to write down the questions. Next morning, he said, I've written down the questions. Can you ask your master what the answers are? He said, why don't we walk over to Darshan and to, to his discourse, which is today, Sunday, it's in the morning. You walk over, read out the questions to me on the way, and I'll ask the master. 
to tell you what the answers are. So he took the paper with him and Mr. Mehta is accompanying Julian Johnson walking to the place where Satsang was, where the discourse was. And the way he asked all those questions, and then they hear the master discourse. And Mehta is looking surprised. And he says, Johnson, this is very strange. The master had answered half my questions already. He answered in the discourse half the questions I had on my paper. He said, wait for another three for the remaining half. He took him on the second day again. Oh, that man, Mr. Mehta, became such a favorite disciple of great master, got initiated. And his family got very worried. He says, why has he got trapped there? That American doctor has taken him away. And he's put him in charge of some voodoo stuff. Some voodoo stuff is going on there in Bias River. And that's where he's taken him. And the oldest sister of the family sent my father-in-law, elder brother of Mr. Mehta, go and bring the boy back. He came, he got trapped also. <laughs> and he became a disciple. These two brothers have taken most of the photographs of great master that are available today, including the movies that were made, few movies. They became such great disciples. And then, when he was convinced and got initiated, he said, I'm not going to leave the Dera, Mr. Mehta said, younger man. And Julia Johnson one day, at night, he said, I'm going to see the master at night. I have something to talk to him. He came back and he was dancing with joy. Master permitted me to go home. He said, what, you going back to America? No, I'm going home. Said, what do you mean? You're not going to die or something? He said, there is no such thing as death. I'm going to my true home. I'm done with my body. And I'm going to home. This is Julian Johnson's story. He says, you know, I go strictly according to the laws of karma. I am that guy with whom I have the, who has enmity from a past life. He'll come and be in the American consulate. And he'll come on this particular day, on a Friday, and he'll have an argument with me. And he'll hit me. And you know, Mr. Mehta, this is the place where my head will hit when I die. So don't be silly. Don't be stupid talking like this. That you're predicting your death in seven days like this, at the hands of a man who will kill you, and you such a great disciple of great master. He says, This is no, you have to, it's for the body, you have to find some way to die. And no one way is worse than the other, so long as you die peacefully in the hands of your master. The master is taking care of you. He said, I am very troubled by this news you're giving. I hope it's not true. It was true. That happened exactly like Mr. Brown came. He had a fight with him, mostly on the religious grounds. That why this missionary had turned turtle on his own mission. And why he had gone to astray with the Indian gurus and so on. He had a little fight. He hit him. Yeah. Then they said, should we register a case of murder or something? The great master said, no. Let him go. It had to be done with. That's what Julian Johnson died. And he predicted seven days in advance and with great joy and happiness. You see, it's very, we are frightened for nothing. Death should never be a frightening experience. Death is not a death at all, it's just change of form. And if you are so attached to people here, so attached to the physical things of this world, then you come again and again over here. And then when you come, you say, oh, it's terrible, it's terrible, I'm in depression, I'm... I am in a terrible state. Why do you want to come again and again into the terrible state? By getting attached to these things. You've done your thing, you've done your karma, you've done your pralabha, your destiny. Fulfilled. Go home peacefully. Enjoy it. But this, this, is, this requires some kind of an experience or faith. It requires faith that life after death is not what we think it is. That there is a great safety in dying. That when you die in the physical body, there's somebody taking care of you. And the master's taken responsibility. One of the biggest advantages of getting initiated by a perfect living master is you not only get a guarantee that the master alone will take care of you. No angels, no short gawky angels will come to you. But the master himself will take care and put you where 
he deserve he think you deserve to go through the rest of your karma he will do that and then it's not an empty promise given by some holy man okay i will take care of you and you die who cares i mean not like that you experience that death while you are alive here you experience exactly what will happen to you you see your future and then you are convinced life is all happiness after that death is also happiness after that this whole spiritual path is a matter of getting experiences in awareness it's not a path to believe blindly anything it's not another faith or another religion at all you can belong to any religion and practice this spiritual path you don't have to change your religion don't have to change your nationality don't have to alter anything in your passport stay where you are just explore the truth inside yourself it's open for the whole universe this teaching is universe so i am very happy that you are not afraid of ghost anymore noi really yes <coughs> Oh, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but uh, I was curious about how you would interpret what's going on right now in the Christian world, all over the world. Today they're celebrating Christ's death on the cross, right? And that he's resurrected. And that's our story. You know, I mean, it appears to me that his spirit, for people who have love and devotion for him, is just as present and alive now as Master Sao Tseng's present is for us today. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's another master. That's right. Except alive. that Master Sawan Singh can do nothing for you, nor can Christ today. You, your, the spirit you believe in is your own spirit that will help you, of course. If you want to have spiritual growth and progress, you must have a living master alive like you, with your kind of body whose hand you can hold. That's all secret. Otherwise, it's a faith based upon your mind. The mind has to believe. and the mind can concoct anything it wants to believe people believe there are the ascended masters sitting in the himalayas i have gone to the himalayas and seen those masters myself personally none of them resemble what they are seeing here it's a mind that's made up the mind can make up anything if there is nobody to tell you that's your mind making up the advantage of a perfect living master a living human being with that ascended consciousness is he can tell you look this is just your own imagination this is just mad made up who else will tell you the spirit won't tell you the spirit tells you what your mind wants to hear that's the problem how will you distinguish between your mind deception taking place inside you and actually an old dead master helping you inside you how do you know that the only real way is if there is a perfect living master who can talk from that level of consciousness who is in touch with the the previous masters also we had a we had a very interesting disciple of great master his name was shadi shadi s h a d i shadi he was a gangster actually he was part of a gang of robbers they would go rob homes institutions and they had a truck a getaway truck and they would escape they heard that there is a place called the dera great master dera and they building a nice building there with a lot of gold to be put on the minarets and stuff and the gold is being donated by the satsangis the women have taken off their jewelry and given it to be melted and put on the building they said that's a good prayer for us we should go and get some gold out of that building It's not yet put on the building; it's still in the homes. So this man was expert in wrecking reconnaissance. He did the wrecking for the gang to grab the gold, and he came to the dera at the time when the great master was giving a discourse. So everybody was listening to the discourse. So he walked about there. There were very few houses in those days; maybe were twenty houses in all in the dera. So he walked there, and he went to the first house. few women were sitting there so why have you gone to the satsa no we are taking up the gold where is the gold in that basket there oh <laughs> that's very easy this is the easiest robbery i can commit went to another place a few children were there uh, what are you doing are we guarding the gold they all told him where the gold lie they were lying there he said this is the easiest way i ever found to find out where the gold is just we come in one swoop we we'll collect everything and go then he thought to himself 
what kind of man is giving them a talk that these people don't care to safe keep their gold they left it in the care of these children and these women and left it so open carelessly what kind of magic does he have that he can draw those people to come and listen to me while the wealth is lying there to be robbed by people like me so let me see what is he saying so he just walked to where the discourse was going on at that moment when he reached that place great master was talking about the beauty of the sound current inside which can pull us with it he said that sound current that true name which rings inside us is in every one of us including gangsters and dacoits he was alarmed so he said how could he recognize me and he said i have to ask him a few questions so he went to get master at the end of the discourse he said master how did you know who i was he said i don't know who you are so you said that that flame of knowledge is glowing and now resounding even in gangsters and robbers i am a gangster you look straight at me when you said that i knew you that guy said says no 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 i don't i say that every day that my sister said that's a common thing i say every this course why are you worried about it says no master don't play tricks with me i know what you done you made me stay back here and get more information on how you know all this stuff stay back great master said what work can you do because we don't allow robbery over here he said i don't know anything else all my life i've just robbed people i have no other talent he said even to rob people you must have some talent you must have done something he said oh yes we have a getaway truck and when the and the electrician of the truck when the truck the armature dynamo goes bad i rewind it and then make it up good we found a job for you great master said go and set up a dynamo and provide some lighting to the dealer so they bought a generator and shadi worked on the generator there was a long belt that used to be run with an oil engine and i remember sitting there and trying to pull the belt because we had to pull the belt to run it you know there was no starter or something so we would pull the belt they would run and then the generator would light up only one light he put up in great master's house first the man all that great passion he has for robbery all the passion he had for what he was doing switched over to great master he was one of the best disciples a, a, a gangster turned saint and then great master said he normally said to people to digest your inner experiences shadi tell them what you saw last night i went back in time i talked to mahamad because i was so, such a strong believer in this i talked to all the prophets and i talked to jesus christ i said and went back to his time great master said that's the way to check out about jesus christ not to believe that somebody is telling you in church go back you have the ability to go back in time in the astral body you have the ability to go back in any area of time of the past or future in your father's body it's not somebody else's body your body inside you working now use that to verify these things don't go on blind belief of some other people's statements shadi was able to have those experiences with old mystics and many others have had experience of other mystics but he was particularly keen that did muhammad really say these things did christ really come was he really put on the cross and be died there did he take away everybody's sin did he modify the rules of karma or something he was keen on that he discovered the whole truth from inside himself you can too anyone can the method is simple that you are not only the physical body embedded inside the physical body is your astral body which is the body of the sense perceptions all sense perceptions you are today ascribing to this physical body are arising from the astral if the astral body is not there physical body is dead you have inside the astral body another body called the causal body which is your mind all thinking processes rationalization is going on there they are functioning at the same time it's not that they you to go somewhere to find your causal body if the causal body is not functioning you can't be functioning in the physical body either then inside the three bodies the 
physical, the Esther, because it is your own self, your soul, your spirit, your consciousness, the life force that is immortal, has never been born, will never die, is part of the totality, has always been part of the totality, experiencing an individuation. That's all within you, each one of you. If you go within and discover who you are, you have access to everything. You have access to the verification of every truth in every scripture of the world. That's what great master recommends. Why go after somebody's story? You do it yourself and discover these truths inside yourself. Ishwar, you, um, you teach us to go within and do our meditation. And there's logical steps that we are to take. If I want to go and talk to Jesus Christ, for example, when do you... And I ask the question first, before I start my meditation, is that... How does that manifest in my meditation? Because it seems like I'm being very rational and saying this is what I want. No, it's not a question of when you ask the question, it's a question of travel, time travel. You when have you to went travel went? back in time. And let me explain this business of time travel. It's a big, it's a big issue. What is time? What is time? Physicists are today studying at length. They never studied since Einstein. They've never been so bothered as they are bothered today. What is the nature of time? What is time? Time and space are no different. But they, he, Einstein said it's an ordinate of space. The three dimensions of space, the fourth dimension is time. Something exists for a certain time. And so instead of a thing, it becomes an event. He made these statements. But what is time? Is time static? Or does it come one after the other in minutes and hours? When you have space, we are sitting here in Wisconsin. Is Chicago being generated when you go towards Chicago or is it there now? It's there now. When you go there, you discover a new experience of space and different places. So is time. The entire time has been laid out already. It's not coming day by day. We are experiencing it day by day. We are time traveling already right now. We are time traveling on the line of time. What is going to happen tomorrow has happened, exists there. You haven't been there, you just walk there. It takes a day, it doesn't matter. In a day you are in tomorrow. But tomorrow exists today. The entire future and the entire past exist in one moment. They have been created in one moment. What happens in meditational experiences is that you are able to, in the astral body, hold time. In the causal body, move back and forth on time wherever you like. So when you see a certain event has happened a thousand years ago, you just have to be there. The event is still there. It will be happening. You won't go and see, oh, I'm seeing an old event. You will be in that event. When you go to the future, you are in that event. The event is already there. And if you think, now I'm deciding to go in time travel like the Egyptians did. Egyptians learned this very simple thing that I'm talking about. That I'm going to time travel and go and see something that happened 2000 years previously or will happen 2000 years hence. In the causal plane, you discover they are both happening at the same time. There is no difference between the past and the future. We are making it based upon the way we are time traveling on time. We are creating the past, the present and the future. Every day, every moment we are creating. I don't know if some of you have solved my puzzle. Let me re restate my puzzle about time. That is it true that the only time in which we are experiencing anything is now? Or do you experience some other time also? Has anybody ever experienced time other than now? Are we not always experiencing now? If it is only now, we are not in any other time frame, not even a second earlier or a second ahead. We are in now. And do you know how much time there is in now? Zero. Not even one nanosecond. One nanosecond becomes the past. And before it comes, it's the future. Now has no time. And we are living only in no time in now. And calling that we are living, we are sat for two hours here, we did all this. How, how does it happen? How can 
you'll be living in now, which is the only available time to live in. The only time in the physical world to experience. I'm not talking about astral world or anything. Physical world we are living now. We are experiencing whatever we are experiencing only in that point of so-called time which we call now. And now has no dimension whatsoever. We are living in a timeless now. And yet we think, five minutes passed. I, I speak so many words which have taken so many seconds to speak. Where did that come from? As soon as I spoke, before I could say now, it was future. The moment I said it was past. We are experiencing the past. We are not experiencing the now at all. We are experiencing the past and calling it now. We are experiencing the immediate past and calling it now and the present. We are making present out of no time. Because we are experiencing the immediate past is becoming now for us. The remote past is becoming a memory. The immediate past is present. Do you know that what we call present is past? Has to be past. Because there is no time in the present. Has to be past. So the past, present is past. The past is past. What about the future? Is there a future? Supposing the human mind stops hoping, stops fearing, stops anticipating. Just three things. We do not hope, we do not fear, we do not anticipate, there is no future. You take these three functions of the mind out, there will never be a talk about future. The word future will be written out of the dictionary. Imagine it. And do you know it's only these three functions of human mind that create a future? To hope takes time. To fear takes time. To anticipate takes time. They all are in the, pre in the present, so-called present, which is past. If you examine this carefully, even future is past. There is no difference. We are living in the past. How can one live in the past? Only through one means, memory. There is no other way to live in the past except by memory. Does it look like that we are living, reliving a memory only? The truth is, physical life is just nothing but reliving a memory. Created elsewhere, where we could hold time. That's the astral plane, not here. So this the whole business of trying to understand time has confused us because of our experiences. Our experience generates a recent memory which is so sharp and clear to us, becomes present. And we think that, oh, we are doing the present, we are now to plan for the future and we are to do all those things. This is all planned out somewhere else, where time can be laid out like space. And we just travel on it. People say, Egyptians could do time travel, and I tell them, you are doing time travel right now. How are you experiencing time? How are you experiencing the future and the past? How, is it, how are events moving in if you don't time travel? We are time traveling at a pace, at a speed set by your clocks and not by your mind. Supposing I sit and give a nice joke to you and talk to you for an hour, it looks like five minutes. To speak about meditation and speak for five minutes looks like an hour. <laughs> but you don't, you don't believe what you experience, you see the clock. So this is how much time has passed. We have relegated our own perception of time to the clocks. We have relegated to the seasons. We have relegated to experiences happening outside of us. That's not how it's created. The creation is very different. Now, if you can raise your level of consciousness to the astral plane, which is very simple in the sense, just vacate the body while you are alive, and you know what the astral plane is. Vacate your astral body while you are alive in both bodies, and you know what the causal plane is. You know the causal plane, you will know the whole series of events which we think are past, present, and future are all one in one now, which is no time. How can the mind understand? You know the mind is a creature of time, space, and causation. It cannot think beyond that. If you tell the mind, well, we have put about 20 events into one now called zero, there is no concept. The mind cannot comprehend it. The comprehension of the human mind is very limited to what can be expressed in terms of time, space, and cause and event. Outside of these things, the mind can't function. If somebody says, love and intuition come from a timeless state of the spirit, it comes from far from beyond the causal state. Our intuition, when we have an intuitive flash, how much time does it take? It takes no time. Thought, even the smallest thought takes time. Thought is a mental process. It will always take time. Intuition is not a mental process. It's a spiritual process. It takes no time. But we take it for granted 
And this is our reality, our perception of reality creates our sense of time and we move along like that. Therefore, when we are in this kind of reality, and we go to a perfectly master. The master we want to verify about Jesus Christ, he says, yes, go and meet him. He's still preaching. He's still giving his sermons. Master, didn't he give his sermon long ago? What is long ago? Long ago means it's on that end of the time. Just like Chicago is at that end, India is at the other end of space. I, I have good imagination. I can, you, I can go and, and imagine that I'm sitting in a satsang with Jesus Christ. But that's not what I thought our meditation was about. Our meditation... No, it's not about it. Meditation is not about going to Jesus or anybody else. Meditation is to go about yourself. Right. Just so to find talking, out who you are. So you're talking about two different things. Absolutely. And Meditation, the spiritual path, is not a discovery of any past as mystics. It's not a discovery of the past, it's a discovery of who you are. And when you discover who you are, you discover the creator of everything. It's as simple as that. Meditation is to remove these veils and covers which are creating separation, individuation in us. And you remove them and you discover that your reality is one totality of consciousness from which the whole show operates. And that's the purpose of true meditation. Not to discover historical facts and so on. Those are only for curiosity. Curious people land themselves with difficulty also. One BB of ours, a very devoted BB, and one of the girls who was taking care of Great Blaster. And you heard, heard the story of the BBs, the three BBs. Some of you may not have heard. There were three girls. Young girls, and they uh, said we will do seva and we'll take care of the Great Master. And there was a lot of scandal about it that this. Old man with a white beard has got three young girls dancing around him. But they were, they were devoted disciples of his. Very devoted disciples. I spent a lot of time with all three of them. One, one was stout, well built. One was thin, lean, but tall. One was short. In their attempt to get close to the great master, the stout one pushed the other down. The thin and lean one, she said, okay, I can't be around the master, I can't take care of his house, can't take care of his clothes and his wardrobe and so on. I'll take care of his kitchen. The kitchen was slightly separate from the main building. So she got took over the kitchen. The third one was ousted by both of them. But the third one made the most progress spiritually. Early morning, the great master would wake us up at 3 o'clock. He would always go and spend time with her. She didn't have to come and run around seeking favors of great master. She made the most progress. She was our neighbor in the Vera. Next house, we lived in one house, he was living in a smaller one room or two room, little quarter next to us. And one day, she was screaming inside. We said, what's happened? She's a good meditator. And we opened the door and she screamed and she screamed. She wouldn't listen to anybody. We said, she's gone hysterical. Something has happened. So we ran and called the great master. The great master came and said, What's happened to you, B.B.? She says, I've gone into hell. How did you go to hell? Curiosity. <laughs> I was just curious to see. What, are they hurting you? No, they're not hurting me. Why are you crying? You're screaming. I can't afford to see how they're torturing people. There's a real torture going on here. I can't afford. She describes some of the torture going on. The great master said, Why don't you come out of it? He said, I don't know how to. Repeat the five words I told you. I've forgotten them. In hell, I forget everything. Okay, can you hear my voice? She said, yes, I can. Follow my voice. And she opened her eyes. And great master told her, see, curiosity can kill the cat. But she was in, <laughs> she was in a meditative state. She That's was. not the kind of meditation you're teaching. No, no. I am, I am warning you against it. Not only not teaching, warning curiosity can kill the kid. That's why I say do not even meditate and go into areas of experiences without the master. First, make sure that you have reached the radiant form of the master and go wherever you like with the master with his protection. Okay. And not go into these, these places. Another time, this, this very baby, this very girl, 
she was locked up in a room and she didn't open the door for three days because she might have died. So we broke open the door and there she was in meditation. And she was in a state of meditation where the ants had come and started crawled up on her feet, on her heel. She had stepped on some brown sugar, which was lying on the floor. And when she walked inside, she must have stepped her heel. And the ants came to eat the sugar off her heel and they began to eat her heel also. So she was half injured in the heel when we discovered her. There was meditation. And there used to be a doctor living in the same town where Ishashi lived. Her name was Dr. Shakuntra. And she used to uh, have made jokes with the great master. Master, you are a very beautiful man, but your talk is not so beautiful. You make up the stories. I don't believe in such kind of this, oh, oh, our own true home and all that. I, I am a doctor. I, what I, I know what the brain can think. I know what it can do. I am also a psychologist. But I don't believe in that all the stuff, spiritual stuff. But I love you for your beautiful face. I love you because you're a nice, beautiful man. So when we found that lady with her heel being eaten up by the ants, the great master was called. And he said, bring the doctor. So we sent the car and brought up to Chikundra. And the, the great master said, doctor, look at this patient of yours. See? She, her feet are being eaten up by the ants and she doesn't even know she's in meditation. The doctor examined, she said, Master, this is no time for jokes. She's in a terrible coma. She's in a deep coma. She has to be removed to the big hospital immediately. Otherwise, she'll be dead very soon. This is not an ordinary coma because she has no feeling left. Uh, and the master said, when there is no feeling, how do the reflexes work? Do they do, do the reflexes? She says, yes, in this deep state, even the normal muscular reflexes go away. She said, can you test them? She took out her little hammer and she knocked. And she said, reflexes are normal. He says, what about the other vital signs? What about her blood pressure, her heart beat and so on, pulse? Can you check that too? She checks. She says, everything is normal. But I can't understand. This is the only case I've seen of such deep coma deep unconsciousness and uh, she has no feelings at all and yet the vital forces are working all right, the vital signs are okay. Master moved her to hospital immediately, it's a new case. Master said, she is having a nice journey in the causal vehicle right now. She is having a great time exploring things that she wanted to explore. The doctor said, Master, no time for making jokes like this at this time. Remove the patient to the hospital immediately. Great master said, but I'll ask her to come and tell you what she has been seeing. I'll just ask her. He said, baby, come get up and tell the doctor. And she opened her eyes. She says, oh, I was having such beautiful. She all that beautiful experience that she was having. After that, the doctor became a disciple. <laughs> not till then. Not till then she didn't believe in any of the spiritual stuff. So we have had such strange experiences of this kind. And these experiences taking place all the time, they lent credence to the teachings in more ways than merely hearing discourses and reading books and all. They don't give you that conviction. But when you see these things with your own eyes and hear with your own and see it for yourself inside you, nothing is more convincing than what convinces you from your own experience. If you try to persuade a man if you try to persuade a man to go and convince people, if you try to convince people against their will, you know what happens? That's what Alexander Pope, the English poet, said. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You know, he was a rhymester. He, he rhymed every line that he wrote in his life. And he couldn't help it. He was a poet of rhyming. Each sentence he would rhyme with the other one. <coughs> In fact, he started rhyming when he was a little child. And his dad gave him a beating. He said, stop this business of talking poetry to us, poetically rhyming every word. And he said, oh no, papa, papa, pity, pay. Words this shall I never make. <laughs> he couldn't stop even then. So, but he said, very right, you can't persuade somebody against their conviction. Conviction comes better with your own experience, 
then we talk for the people. It doesn't matter who talks. So that's why great master teaching has been so wonderful for me because he did not rely on anybody's speech, not even his. He said, don't even believe my word unless you can verify experience with your experience. So it's an experiential thing. I'll be seeing you tomorrow again in the morning for the workshop. Enjoy your dinner. I'll see you tomorrow. God bless.